Today is one 200 pound guy in a single occupancy automobile driving a 4,000 car pound car through an asphalt landscape redolent with the aroma of foreign oil, right? <laughs> Imagine instead that you're flying past the trees, you are hearing the birds, you're feeling the breeze, you're traveling through a green landscape, you are your lungs are pumping fresh air. You can smell the grass. Your heart is working off those calories and keeping your arteries clean, clear. And your eyes are making contact with other people flying through the air, feeling great. How did we get here? We walked, right? Um, back in the day, it was all active transportation. It was all human-powered transportation. And our first transportation network were pathways. Elmwood Avenue, Plymouth Avenue, Genesee Street, uh, all Indian trails then, roads now. When the Europeans came, things began to change, of course. However, um, the real change began in the 19th century. In 1803, Nathaniel Rochester bought a promising parcel of land just north of here. And a mere three years later, we had our first public transportation, an ox cart that went from Rochesterville to Indian Point twice a week. And so it began. But what really made our region was, of course, the Erie Canal. By 1830, they had completed the greatest public works project in the history of the United States. The aqueduct on Court Street, right over somewhere within a block or two of here, um, was being called the eighth wonder of the world. And there were barges of, you know, heading across. It was a major, major achievement. There was not a professional engineer among them. And from this came the Canal Network, which was our next major um, transportation network. But the industrial era rode in 10 years after the close of the um, Erie Canal, after the opening of the Erie, Can Erie Canal in the form of a railroad. And of course, then began a 100-year rise in rail traffic and industrialization. And between the canal and the railroad, Rochester became a boom town. But as dominant as the train station and the trains seemed to be, there was a brief moment of glory in the 1890s. If you think the internet craze or the iPod or any of these things that we think were, are, are a big deal, they talked about bicycle mania. People went crazy over the safety bike. Uh, not like the one that we had here, which I rode in on today, um, because I didn't want anyone to ask, did you ride or did you drive? Uh, but, you know, the basic safety drive, two even-sized uh, wheels with pneumatic tires and, and steering arrangement. Turns out an amazing design called one of the most innovative designs ever. Tailors were going out of work. They said, people are not wearing out their good suits. 40% of the tailors in America went out of work in the 1890s because everyone was wearing these tacky um, bicycle outfits and not wearing their good suits. Uh, piano sales dropped by 50% because you could buy two bikes for the price of one piano. Churchman said, this is a disaster. This is a technological threat to organized religion because people were going biking on Sundays. This was a big, big deal. In 1896 alone, they manufactured one bicycle for every 30 Americans. We had bicycle turnpikes in Rochester. The public loved it. 
Susan B. Anthony here in Rochester said, nothing has done more for the liberation of women than the invention of the bicycle. And indeed, the ramifications are even greater than we, we usually think. We learned about mass manufacturing through the bicycle. Um, a couple of bicycle makers, I have a postcard on my, uh, uh, on my wall from, I think, Orville Wright. He says, I have become possessed by the vision that men can fly. He was a bicycle maker, he and, and Wilbur, and they did it. The bicycle movement also gave rise to the good roads movement. Paved roads were brought in with the support and with the advocacy of bicycle advocates. Of course, there were problems. There were um, policemen whose job it was to stop speeders on bicycles. Um, eight miles an hour was the speed limit, right? It was seen as, as a potential uh, threat. But it was a huge development, a huge development. And at the time, it seemed like the beginning of a new era. H.G. Uh, Wells, author of The Time Machine and of The War of the Worlds, said, when I see a man on a bicycle, I cannot despair for the future of the human race. <laughs> but if he saw the 20th century, he would despair, because within 10 years of that peak of bicycle mania, the Model T Ford rolled into town, and it stole the 20th century. Right? Those roads that the bicyclists had put in were now dominated by automobiles, and it dwarfed that 100-year rise in the train system. Roads, highways, cars, a huge deal. We had a brief period of trolleys and subways right around the corner. Uh, but somehow Rochester became all about the automobile. By the 1960s, it was so much all about the automobile that a city white paper said, we need to redesign our city in order to accommodate the automobile. Goodbye trolleys, goodbye subways, hello inner loop, or inner noose, right? As I like to think of it. Um, this curve, actually, that's about the shape of vehicle miles traveled from 1908 until about 1990. It was just the number of miles, more and more people traveled more and more miles in more and more cars, cars constantly through World War I, through World War II, up into the 60s. Between the 60s and the 90s, the number of vehicle miles traveled went up fourfold again. Right? This is what we do. This was the 20th century. But as a matter of fact, for the last few years of the 20th century, the shape of that curve changed. For the first time in the history of the automobile, in the history of the era that we think we're still in, but we are not, vehicle miles plateaued. If you look carefully, it seems pretty clear that this is coincident with the, uh, the rise in gas prices, also with the rise in the realization that we had all of these issues. Um, public spending on bicycle infrastructure is actually going way up. I say way up, even though it's still a fraction of a percent on what we spend on automobile and traditional infrastructure. The era of the single passenger automobile is ending for all sorts of reasons that we're increasingly familiar with, some of them by constraint, some of them by option, because increasingly it's being realized that it is an embarrassingly powerful solution and an embarrassingly simple solution to many, many complex problems in society today. It's a little hard to believe, but listen, um, the late, great Stephen Jobs had something to say about it. I think it. one of the, the things that really separates us from the high primates is that uh, we're tool builders. And I read a, uh, a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer. And uh, humans came in uh, with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. It was not, not uh, too proud of a showing for the crown of creation. So uh, 
That didn't look so good, but then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And a man on a bicycle, or a human on a bicycle, blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. Steve Jobs really got this, you know. He, before they talked sense to him in his head, he wanted to call the Macintosh the bicycle. <laughs> he did. Um, and he, they marketed it, as some of us will remember, as a bicycle for the mind. And in fact, it was, um, he, he used that phrase in a, another part of this video. But with all due respect for someone who really knows something about innovation and about changing the way people live and work and enjoy themselves, um, it's not just a bicycle for the mind. It's a bicycle for the bicycle. It's still, an ama it's still a miracle. It's still a miracle. Um, suppose I told you that I had an invention which not only was hyper-efficient, but was non-polluting, inexpensive, combats obesity, reduces traffic fatalities, prolongs life, fights depression, and has been right under our nose for 100 years. Now, we had a conference here in April, um, the Greater Rochester Active Transportation Symposium, and these facts came together. And one version of them is the Greater Rochester Active Transportation System. Most of you have bicycles. Most of you know the good routes in your neighborhoods. The Greater Rochester Active Transportation System demonstrates this amazing thing, which is that Rochester's geography makes it one of the most attractive biking environments in the country. Basically level land, and we have car-free riverway trails and car-free canalway trails cutting north, south, and east, west, and a potential network of car-free greenways and neighborhood greenways, neighborhood greenways, low traffic, designated streets designed to attract cyclists, walkers, to allow kids to play in the street without worrying about cars rushing through, and by the way, it's a transportation system. It should be our next transportation network. We just haven't marked it. Rochester Multiversity. We have 19 universities and 80,000 students, and most of those students are on campuses within a half a mile of one of these car-free greenways. Right? What are we waiting for? And the scenery, if you go north, you go to High Falls and the lake. If you go south, you go to RIT. The Erie Lackawanna Bridge is now crossing the river. This is not a dream. They're going to say, you're going to say, but we have winter here, and it's not safe. Um, first of all, the number one bicycle city in America is Minneapolis. <laughs> number two, there have been a number of studies recently from Barcelona, from Britain, one from Wisconsin, right? which suggests that while there are safety issues with bicycles and we should do something about them, the benefits outweigh the risks about 9 or 70 to 1. Two different studies, but that's the drift, right? <laughs> the point is you're safer on a bicycle than you are on your couch. <laughs> and your grandchildren are going to ask you, what did you do when the world changed and you had the potential to create the next version of what H.G. Wells called utopia. He said, bicycles will abound in utopia. This is our moment. This is our chance. You have to ask. We've made great progress. I'm asking you to help. Thank you.